Good morning, Riverside. My name is Amy Nichols. I'm so delighted, happy to be here with you this morning to share in this time of worship and just welcome you. And if you're a guest with us today, whether you're in this room or listening online, I'd like to take a moment and say welcome to you. We hope that you feel a part of our Riverside family just by coming. And we are a family. We are a family who has a common goal, a common mission. That is to help people find and follow Jesus. And so if you're here with us today, that is our goal with everything that we do. We want to help you find and follow Jesus. Let's open in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we're so grateful today. Grateful that we serve a God who is so loving and kind and patient with us. Lord, I think of how many times we bow our heads in prayer and rattle off our list of things that we want you to do for us or we want you to say to us and then we rush off about our day, not even taking a moment to listen to what you would be saying to us. And so I pray today, God, that we would still ourselves, that we would come before you with ears that are open and listening, that we wouldn't rattle off all the things that are on our hearts and not take time to hear what you would be saying to us. You are reaching out to us, God, and we want to draw close to you. And we can only do that when we set aside everything else that would be in our, our way. Help us to set aside distractions. Help us to confess those things that we need to lay before your feet and to be able to truly draw close to you this morning. I lift up all of my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, and I just pray that you would help us to bind together within this family and also closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
are filled with glory. Our praises rise to you this morning. Jesus, would you be here with us? Lord, you are enthroned above all. Lord, would you come in? Riding on our praise, Jesus, would you come in? Would you cover us? Lord, you died on a cross, the perfect sacrifice. A perfect sacrificial lamb to cover our sins. And then you rose from the grave like a lion. And you saved us from ourselves and created that bridge. You bridged that gap to heaven so we could be with you forever. So, Lord, we praise you. Lord, we're not confused. It is you whom we pray. It's you who we seek today. Lord, some of us in this room, we're knocking. So please open the door. Lord, some of us, we're seeking. Help us to find you. Lord, we love you so much. And we're looking for you. So Lord Jesus, as we study your scriptures, and as we sing your prayer, you open our hearts? Would you make a way for us to know you better, to know you deeper? Lord, we want to know your ways to be with us today. Lord, it is so good to worship as a family, to worship you. You are who we worship. Jesus, by the Father, and the Holy Spirit, you are our God, and we love you. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, if you are a guest with us today, oh yeah, you may have a seat for sure. <laughs> um, if you're a guest with us today, we're glad that you're here and we hope that you have been feeling welcomed, at least as far as I'm concerned. I hope you felt welcome so far. Um, and we want to let you know a little bit about us and we would like to get to know a little bit about you. So if you look in the back of the seat, there's a pocket and you can find a welcome brochure that will tell you some of the things about Riverside. And there's also an information card where you can um, fill that out and let us know a little bit about you. And you can drop that in the bucket or even at the Connection Center as you go. We thank you in advance for doing that. Also, don't forget, we have a Riverside app. You can download that now if you don't already have it. It helps you follow along with the message as well as um, keep up on different groups and events that are happening. Um, and I have three of those that I need to mention to you today. First of all, next Sunday. Everybody say, next Sunday. Louder. I love having that control. Um, so next Sunday, there's a session called Ready to Grow. And if you are a believer, if you have accepted the gift of salvation and um, made Jesus the head of your life, and you're just wondering, how do I follow the next steps? What do I do to be a follower of him. Well, this session is for you. It's occurring next Sunday during service, and you can find out all of the details as well as register in the app, or you can stop by with more questions at the Connection Center. We'd love to see you there. Secondly, where are my ladies at? Raise your hand, ladies. All the la ladies, raise your hands. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> um, we are having a Beth Moore simulcast. I don't know if you can feel the excitement from my body, but I love women studying God's word together, and we are doing it Saturday, October 15th. You can look in the app, or you can come find me, and I will tell you everything you need to know about this event. It is going to be awesome. She has released the title, and it's called Hold On. I don't know how many of you need to hear the word about hold on from God, but I know I do, so I hope you'll join us. Um, you can find the details in the app, like I said, and register online there, but you can also come find me, and I'll tell everything you need to know. Lastly, in just a few weeks, baptism is happening. Can I get up? There we go. Good job. Good job. The baptisms will be happening at both locations, and we are excited. I already know some people that are um, registered to be baptized. If you are a believer and you have not been baptized, it is your time. God is calling you to publicly declare your faith in him, and you can sign up to be baptized. And I'm telling you, 
all of this family as well as the heavenly realms will be rejoicing with you on that day. So let us know if you have any questions. Now, those are the announcements that I was told to give, but I do have one more announcement. Sorry. Um, <laughs> before Pastor Michael comes up, I want to know how many of you like me appreciate this man of God right here? Yes, as well as all of the other pastors, am I right? We appreciate all of our pastors. And I could not stand up here with this microphone in my hand after these uh, men and women of God go to their knees every day for us. They care about us and our families. They seek out his word to give to us week after week. And I could not stand up here with this microphone and not tell you that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So you need to write a letter, send a text, get a card, whatever it looks like for you. Show all of our pastors your love and appreciation appreciation because God has called them to shepherd us. And it says in 1 Thessalonians that we should show them our love for the work that they do. So I just want to throw that out there. Now, I don't know who's going to do communion because they're going to fire me from my job. I don't think you're allowed to go off script, but um, as Pastor Michael comes, you can open the app and um, God bless you today. Good morning. Are you well? Y'all are the best, you know? You just are. And if there was a script, we lost it and went off of it long ago, Amy. You know that. Just real up here, making myself look silly every week, just about. Can only be ourselves, right? But it is an honor to be your pastor. And I'm thankful for Pastor David and Pastor Jay and all the pastors at our church. It's a tough time. It's a tough time, but it's a good time, and I see nothing but goodness ahead for the church of Jesus Christ, and that's exciting news this morning. It's good news this morning, and so I'm glad you're here this morning, and just to begin, I'm going to do something a little um, abnormal, not abnormal, um, but I just really, <sighs> Ephesians chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. And I want to start by just reading Ephesians chapter 3 in a whole, in its entirety. And so I'm just going to read it, and let's just listen to it. Because um, here this morning, I'm reminded of, of the fact that this is holy ground. This is sacred ground where we exist here together. Did you feel the presence of God as we were worshiping? He's here in this place, and his word is sacred. His word is holy. It is filled with truth that has come to us from God. That is something to pique our attention. That is something that should capture our interest. And so I want to read Ephesians chapter 3 in whole. It takes about two and a half minutes, depending on, you know, how many words, you know, how fast I read. But all right, let's listen to this. This is good. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Oh, that's good. Ephesians chapter 3. That's a good word. It's a good word. And some here are like, what just happened? What? What's he saying in there? We're in part three of our series, Living Masterpieces. I believe and know that God has, de has designed people to become living masterpieces. That God wants to enter into people's lives and he wants to transform them. He wants to remake them. He wants to change them into becoming living masterpieces. God creates living masterpieces. That's what he does. He's in the business of redemption and rescue and recreation, creating living masterpieces. He is the best. I wrote this down. He is the best. His ways are the best. His ethic, his truth for individuals, for families, for relationships, for the world. God's way is best. It is. And it can be experienced as best. That's why we're so obsessed here at Riverside at helping people find and follow Jesus. Because that's loving. You want to love people well, you help them get to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus changes people's lives. He turns them into living masterpieces. Don't we want to live on the best way? Don't we want to live our best lives, most meaningful, most purposeful, as God has designed you to live? As created beings, we should go to the creator, for he is the one who reveals how we were meant to live. It's the creator who knows what's best for his creation. It's the designer who knows how we should live according to our design. And he wants you and I, us, to be living masterpieces. Ephesians chapter 3, which I read in whole, helps us see how we can become and live as living masterpieces. What are facets of that living masterpiece that we have been called to live up to and live to be and been invited to become, to become this living masterpiece? Ephesians chapter 3 is so helpful. All of Ephesians is helpful, which is where we're kind of honing in for this series of living masterpieces. But as I studied and I reflected and I meditated on Ephesians chapter 3, I couldn't help but think of James chapter 4 verse 8, which is not all that weird because this is one singular word of God. And so scripture is going to help interpret scripture and support scripture. That's a method of studying scripture. If you see something here in the scripture, but not over here, that's going to be a bit problematic. When you see it all over, then you're like, there we go. We got it. There are 66 books, and yet it is one word of God, the scriptures. So as I was studying Ephesians chapter 3, I couldn't help but think of James chapter 4, verse 8, which is a good kind of verse to keep in the back pocket, to take out all the time. James chapter 4, verse 8, says this. I think it really captures Ephesians chapter 3. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. 
That's short. That's sweet. That's life-changing. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It's a revolutionary statement. It's a big statement. I have titled this morning's message, Reach Out. Reach out. I want us to reach out. I want us to reach for God. For if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Now, here in Ephesians chapter 3, there are a lot of, there's a lot, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter, church in Ephesus, it was meant to circulate, it was designed by God, this letter, to reach us here today and to help us here today. I know that God knows that you are going to be sitting where you're sitting here today. I believe no one is here by accident. I believe that God has something to do in this place and in our hearts here today. And Paul talks about this mystery, the mystery of God. What is this mystery, this mystery of God? It kind of has its origins in the origin of the beginning of the creation of the world. In Genesis, we see that God created the world and he created it as good. And then in Genesis chapter 3, and if you grew up in church or you didn't grow up in church, you know the whole Adam and Eve thing. And taking a bite of this fruit when they were commanded not to. And as such, sin entered into the world and separation and death entered into the world. Separation from God. When people were created to live in relationship with God, sin entered the world and divorced that relationship separated that relationship, which is hugely problematic, for we were designed to live in connection and relationship with God. People were deserving, you and I included, were deserving of death and separation from God forever, which is a huge deal, for God is love, and God is good, and God is all that we were designed to experience as people for human flourishing and goodness and uprightness. So it's a big problem. And God didn't, wasn't satisfied in letting people just stay separated from him. And so he started his awesome act of rescue and redemption. Thank God. And we see a progression of God rescuing people from destruction. We're starting in the beginning in Genesis. And there comes this moment where there's Abraham. This guy Abraham who has a faith, a trust in God. And this pleases God, this faith and trust in God. Abraham pleases God because of his trust and his faith. And as a result, in Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 through 18, he says this. I will surely bless you speaking to Abraham. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Okay. That's a big promise. It's like, Hey, Kevin, because of your faith and trust, it's like God talking to you. All the nations on the earth are going to be blessed because of you. Okay, that's awesome. How? How? That's the mystery. Paul's talking about there's this mystery. How is this going to happen? These promises, these grand claims of God, all the nations are going to be blessed. How is this going to happen? We then see, fast forward, complete spoiler alert, you ready? The mystery is cleared up in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mystery. It is through him that all nations would be blessed, that all nations will be affected. It is through Jesus. He is the answer for all of the rescue and the redemption. It is Jesus, 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 which is why when you first walk into Riverside Community Church, you see this like thing sprawled across the front of the wall that says, we exist to help people find and follow who? Jesus. It's Jesus. 
Jesus. Because of what Jesus does, Jesus, who he is and what he does, oh, all of the scriptures point through and to Jesus. This was the culmination of God's saving act is God coming into this world himself, Jesus. And as a part of that, Jesus coming into this earth, okay, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6 says this, Paul, the, this mystery is that through the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. This is monumentally huge. This is huge. I can't, like, I would start yelling, but it would be uncomfortable. That's what I feel like saying, to be like, hey, this is big. This is, like, real big. This is huge. This one is actually massively big and has effect on, I would imagine, everyone just about in this room. Big deal here. Because in the scriptures, God started saving. His saving act of humanity began with a particular closed group of people. And it was exclusive. It's, I'm going to save these people. I'm going to progressively reveal who I am to this world through these people because the world is so fallen and so broken. And yet, through these people, I am going to bless all people from these people. Okay. That's the mystery. How? Boom. Jesus Christ. And there's the nation of Israel, God's people, and the designation of Gentile, which is everyone who is not God's people. And here's the mystery. Let's put it back up on the screen here. Ephesians 3, 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, through Jesus, the good news of Jesus, the Gentiles, those who are outside, the outsiders of the family of God, are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. You follow? This is big. What was exclusive became inclusive. What was unavailable became available. What was inaccessible became accessible. The gate of entry into relationship with God went from being this one group of people now open to all people, including all of us here today. This is big. Did I say that? It's like... And any analogy is probably going to fall short on how gloriously awesome this is. But it is, it, it is as monumentally big as there are 195 countries in this world. It would be like all 195 of those world leaders of these countries coming together in this singular place, this, this room, and saying, you know what? We're just going to become one. We're just going to become one. Be like, what? How? Really? What? No. Like, mind-blowing. It rarely serves as a good, it, it hardly serves as a great example because it's just so unbelievable that it's like, eh, okay. But that's how big this was. The fact that God would open up relationship to all people. Relationship with God is open that door to all people. Christianity is open for all people. This is a message to the church. The church is the collected assembly of God's believers. Christianity is for, quote, them. Christianity is for them. Who are them? I know I said it wrong. Who are they? There's always a they. There's always a them. There's always that group or those people who are difficult for us. I've got them. You want me to tell you? I'm just kidding. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> 
Come on. Christianity and the church was never designed to be just an exclusive club. It's meant for them, all those people. God went to great lengths to open the door to all people. I think we need to be reminded of this truth, church. I'm thankful for the way our church exists. We have a loving group of people here. People who welcome people into the family of God. I really mean that. I wouldn't say it. I would just keep moving on <laughs> if it wasn't true. And I would harp on this because it would be like a problem that we need to correct. I like preventative maintenance. And I always want us to remember that th this, this place, Christianity, Jesus, God, is for them. For those who maybe the world would turn their back on for those who are so beaten down, for those who have gone so far astray, for those who have come in and have left, this is for them. It's for them. Which then, let me kind of make it a bit personal here. If you're here in this place, and, and even this place, or Christianity, or God, or Jesus, that feels like so outside of your league or realm of possibility, Christianity is for you. It is for you. This is for you. God has a plan for your life. God wants to do something miraculous in your life. God wants to become something so powerful in your life that you need nothing else to survive. You need nothing else to survive. You just need Jesus. You just need the love of Jesus. It can transform your life. Christianity is for you. I do want to give a massive disclaimer. Jesus will take us as we are, but he will not leave us as we are. I've got to tell you this, and I almost have to say this as a pastor, because I'm finding more and more and more that this expectation is not understood with Jesus somehow. He takes us as we are, but he will not leave us as we are. Jesus refers to himself as both the door, and the way. I actually find that our current contemporary modern culture loves Jesus as the door. Because as the door, Jesus says, come as you are. Just come. I want you to come in. I want to enter into relationship with you. I died for you. I love you. You are known. You have intrinsic value. I have a, a plan and a purpose for your life that is so inherently good and purposeful and meaningful. It's so satisfying. may not always be easy, but it is so satisfying. Come as you are. You don't need to tidy yourself up first. But I'm such a mess. I'm so broken. I'm such... Come as you are. I am the door. Culture's like, ooh, I like this Jesus. He's a door. It's, accept me just as I am, and he does. But he's also the way. People don't like Jesus as the way. Because he will take us as we are. He will not leave us as we are. He calls us to live a life that is described as being, again, this is the disclaimer, this is for you. It is like a death every day. You pick up your cross, and you are to die to these natural inclinations that you have, that I have. We are to put those to death, even though they might seem right, even though they're supported by everyone around us, even though this is what I really want. God says, okay, if that wants and desires and those things that are being supported by culture, are kind of hitting up against the way that I have for your life, you got to put those things to death, and you need to run the way that I have marked out for you. Why? Because I'm your loving creator. I have the way forward for you that is going to help you become the living masterpiece you were designed to live. It's not all doom and gloom. I believe that as we walk in this light and in this refreshing goodness of God, oh, it becomes a blessing to your soul. You become a pillar in this world. You become satisfied. He gives you fruit 
like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, a living masterpiece. As C.S. Lewis says, we as people, though, are just far too easily pleased with our own desires and our own wants. But this is the disclaimer. Christianity is for you. And we need to put to death this lie of the enemy that says, you're not good enough to enter in. Jesus, as the door says, come as you are. I'll take all the baggage and all the mistakes, and I'm here to wash those clean and forgive and work and sanctify and change and transform you. Come as you are, but you may not and cannot remain as you are. That's what God has in store for his followers. It's the difference between the world's just pleasure with Jesus as being a spiritual guide. Guide me. I don't want to be guided anymore. Guide versus king. All hail King Jesus. That's what we sing because he's the king. But he's a good king. He's a perfect king who's got your best interests at heart. And the doors have been opened wide to all and to everyone to come in. I find this is so satisfying in this world because as I look around, I see division everywhere. I see it everywhere. You and I, we all see it. I see one effective solution. It's Jesus. I'm a pastor. That's what I have to say, right? No, I sincerely believe it. I see it true every single day. Right here in this room, I see people of different ages and backgrounds and incomes and education and the whole thing, and yet we are all family in this place. We are a physical here in this place. Look around. This is a representation of the reconciling work of God. The fact that we come together here in this place as family. Like, I genuinely see you as brothers and sisters, as my family. That's powerful. That's what God does. He saves people individually and adopts them into his family. He becomes father. And as people are adopted into his family, then people become brothers and sisters. It's the great equalizer, Jesus, in relationship with him. It's huge in a world that is so divisive. This is designed, the church, to be a community that is to be a witness to God's reconciling work, which is why when I observe division in this world, I'm becoming very singularly focused. Jesus, 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 we got to get this world, we got to get our communities, got to get our families, if there is division, to Jesus. This is the mystery that's been shown in Jesus, is that he is creating one body, and how glorious this is, that there's a Christianity that is available for the, quote, them and for you. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, he continues on and says, in him, Jesus and through faith in him, trust in him, belief in him, synonyms, faith. We may approach God with freedom and confidence. Someone needs to hear this verse this morning. Someone needs to see this truth of God here this morning. In him, Jesus, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This might seem like an oversimplification, but this verse, the fact that we can approach God means that God is approachable. How many of us come from backgrounds in religion where it's like, God's not approachable? Terrify to him. He just wants nothing to do with me. Here, that experience flies in the face and falls in the face of the truth of God that says, in Jesus and trust in him, God is not only approachable, that you may approach him with freedom and confidence. Do you find in your life right now that you can confidently talk and approach, talk to and approach God? God, the all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, creator, fully control God, in control God of the universe, do you have absolute confidence an assurance that you have an audience with God, that when you pray, he is hearing. 
that when you're living, he is with you. That is what is available. Did I hear a child say, yeah? Y'all, I'm about to preach a second sermon. That's why God tells us to have a childlike faith. Don't cry. We can run to God with boldness and confidence and openness. Someone needs to see these words on this screen this morning. God is within reach. This is for someone here this morning. God is within reach. When life gets so desperate, when life gets so difficult, when there are these moments where you disappoint yourself, those are powerful moments, aren't they? What's your standard of yourself? For those who matter most to you and speak ill over your life, when the enemy's lies are beginning to become true in not only your mind and in your heart, God is within reach. No matter how desperate it gets, I am telling you, God is within reach. I want to ask uh, this question here. Where does our world reach? Where does our world reach? When they're in moments of desperation and difficulty, what about in, in moments of prosperity? Where, are, where is our world reaching? Where is our world grabbing and holding? Where are we collectively as a community? Where are we reaching? What about you, I, us, me, personally? You. <laughs> Where do I tend to reach? This is a powerful question. Maybe one worth writing down. Where do I tend to reach? When I'm looking for my own self-worth, when I'm looking for relief, when I'm looking for rescue, where do I tend to reach? This is what Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. This is a moment, church. This is a prayer not only for the church at Ephesus. This is a prayer for us here today. This is life-changing, become a living masterpiece kind of a prayer. Paul prays in Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, speaking of God, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is a powerful prayer. Paul is praying, I pray that Christ would be in your life that your trust in him, your rootedness in him would yield a change in your life, a powerful change in your life, that the more you trust and believe and place your faith in Jesus, who he is and what he has for your life, that the love that he has for you would just sink deep into your innermost being, that you would be strengthened as a result. This is what God wants us to focus on, is his love for you, his love for us. The enemy wants to distract us. Look over here. Look how messed up this is. Look how messed up the world is. Look how messed up you are. Look at the world's going down. You're going down with it. Your kids aren't safe. You're not safe. 
Okay, okay. What does the word of God say? What does the truth of God say? It speaks of a different reality. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, in God, for God is love, that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God is within reach. You see, Christianity is for you. God is within reach. So reach out to him. Because when we reach out, this is this text. When we reach out, God will reach in. He will reach into your life. When you reach out to God, he will reach into your life. He will remind you of how loved you are. And he will strengthen you in your innermost being. He wants you to live as a living testimony in this world. That you wouldn't be overcome by the difficulties of this world or of your own past, but instead that Christ would dwell in your life. And I keep doing this because I know that God just wants to stir in our lives an understanding, a heart posture, where his love becomes more and more and more real to you and me. So much so that it is life-changing. that we would become living masterpieces as a result of this love becoming more and more real to our lives. Living masterpieces constantly reach for God. Ephesians chapter three, reach for God, reach for God. For those of you who have kids, when your kids are in need, what is it that they do? Where is our world reaching? Where do I tend to reach? Reach for God. For when you reach out, he will reach in. I'm devastated seeing people in this world reach out to just smoke. It feels like there's something there. It's like a bunch of this in this world, right? It's desperate. It's waving. We're trying to go after different things. I'm ready to see the world reach out to something where then there is a hold on the other end, where God will then reach in and transform a person's life. Trust him. This is what it means to reach out. It means to trust him. It means to approach him. It means to talk to him. It means to enter into the door of relationship with him, but then also put to death those things he calls to put death in full understanding that a loving God would not call you to put something away that is good for you. He is a loving God. He has your best interest at heart. And that will prove to be true as we take those difficult moments where we're saying, okay, I'm going to lay this down. It's a huge part of who I am. The world celebrates it, I'm putting it down, and I'm walking in your way. This is what it means to reach out to God. And when you reach for God, oh, he will reach into your life, and it'll be glorious. It'll be good. It'll be amazing. Has it been good, Bruce? Has it been good? Abby, is it good? 
Is it good, Melissa? It's good. In just a moment, we're going to take a moment and remember <laughs> we're reaching for God. Remember, he reached for you. At a very high cost, he reached for you. Why? Because he loves you. He knows you. He wants to rescue you. He wants to save you. He wants to change you, remake you into a living masterpiece. That's what communion, what we're going to celebrate here this morning. The act of Jesus dying for you, God demonstrating his love for you, so much so that he died for you as represented by the blood and the bread, the juice and the bread, the blood in his body. And so let's take a moment here this morning to reach for God. Amen? Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for your word. You're a good God. We thank you that you've opened the door for a relationship, to relationship with you, that this is for us. Regardless of the broken past and the things people have said and what I've even said, God, I pray that you would help me, help us to reach for you, the God who loved us so much that he died for us at Calvary, that he's risen from the grave and he is the king of this world. God, I pray that you would strengthen and renew our hearts here in this place. I pray that out of your glorious riches, you may strengthen us with your power through your spirit in our innermost being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through our faith in you. And I pray that you would help us to become rooted and established in love, that we would have power together with all of God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's take a moment here this morning, church, and reach for God in our worship and adoration of him. And then Amy's going to come and lead us through communion together. Love y'all. Stand as we worship.
So as I was preparing for communion last week, I began by reading Matthew 26, 26. And there was a part of the passage that literally jumped off the page to me. I'm sure I've read it thousands of times, hundreds of times. And yet in this moment, it was like it was in bold print. And it said, while they were eating. And it hit me that Jesus didn't call a special meeting he didn't have brought in some expensive choice cut of meat or some, you know, fancy aged wine or something. While they were eating their meal, he used the bread and the wine, the common things that were there. And I thought to myself, God, how can you use the common things when it's such an amazing thing that we're remembering? How can you use the common things? And then I realized he didn't come as a political powerhouse to overthrow the government. He wasn't born in a palace. He didn't ride in on a horse with regal clothing and jewels and crowns. He chose the common. He came as a baby, born in a stable. He rode in on a donkey. He came to choose the common because he loves us and he wanted to die for us and he wanted to show us that through service, through his death on the cross and through coming to serve and to love, he could take those common things and it's because of him that they become divine elements. That because he is divine and he is holy, that when he takes those things that seem so common, they become divine because of him. And he can use them. He's not worried about being reduced by the things that seem common to us. He is God, the God of all creation. He's not worried about his image. He could have come to show off, but he came to serve and to love and to die for you and for me. And so as we take these communion elements today, we're doing it in rem remembrance. And although we're physically taking in the bread and the juice, it's something much more supernatural that we're remembering here, something much more divine. They represent the reminder that he is holy. He is without spot or wrinkle, blameless, and he has no sin. And we are not, we are not holy. We want to become more and more like him, but we are not. And the Bible says that light and darkness cannot exist in the same place. And so I felt led in my prayer time that before we can even take these elements today, we have to, as much as it depends on us, get ourselves right with, before God. And what's so amazing is something Pastor Mike said was exactly what God laid on my heart, that the world today, they would like to convince us, the enemy would like to convince us that if we haven't murdered anyone, if we haven't robbed a bank, then we don't have darkness and sin. We're fine. You're fine. He would want to have us stay in that place because if we are staying in that place, we are separated. There is a degree of separation between us and God. As long as we have pride, hatred, gluttony, lying, knowing the right thing to do and not doing it, jealousy, envy, lust, if we have any of those things, and as he said, we have to lay those down every single day. And so we're gonna take one moment right now, and I would just ask you to bow your head if you wanna kneel, that's totally fine too. And we're just going to get ourselves 
as right as we can by confessing anything that we need to lay at God's feet, and then we will partake and pray together. And the Bible says, after he had given thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat. This is my body. Let's take together. It goes on to say, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you came as the perfect example, the perfect example, someone who could have come in might and to show off, and you came to serve and to love and to die for us. Help us to follow that model. As we remember your sacrifice, help us to want to follow in your footsteps. Help us to come as humble Christ followers. Help us to come as people who want to serve others that we not think highly of ourselves, that we not go around, you know, feeling like we have nothing to confess. Lord, to help us to realize that every single day we have to lay everything at your feet and to serve others with love, that they might sense and feel what you've come to do through us. Help us, Lord, to take off anything that would keep us separated from you. We wanna draw close to you and we know that you're reaching for us, Lord. Help us to reach back through gratitude, worship, service, confession, repentance, and service to others. Thank you, God. We love you so much, and we thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. If he dressed as the man with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you if he watches over every sparrow? How much more does he love? You? Sing that out with your heart. If he dresses the lilies with beauty and 
Riverside Community Church. Where are we reaching? We're going to be reaching for God. We're going to be reaching for God. I would encourage you to reach for God, that you would reach out to God, for as you reach out, he will reach in. Amen? Amen? I would encourage you to reach out to God by reading his word this week. I want to encourage you in the Bible reading plan and you version to read Ephesians, his glorious riches. And that as you read God's word, that he may dwell more and more in your life, in your innermost being, strengthening you, making his love more and more real to your life in a transformative way. That's my prayer for you as it was Paul's prayer for us. Thank you so much for your giving here in this place. want to bring to attention uh, an effort that we kind of undertake as a church every October called Operation October. It's a food drive to help our local communities, those who are in need. And so non-perishable food items, there's more info in the app, in the events and outreach uh, section there to learn more about Operation October. And so today is the food drive and next week as well. And so you can also give to that in, by clicking on the giving button in the app. And our church always shows up in a really strong way. And I always encourage, if you forgot this week, you could run over to Aldi, which it is Aldi, by the way, not Aldi's. I know that's, blo I know it's, <laughs> but you can go to Aldi and then come back. And already I can see from here that thank you, those of you who have brought non-perishable food items for this drive. And I, I want it to be a blessing to our community all in the name of Jesus. Why? Because those without food should eat. That's an act of reconciliation, reconciling that which is wrong, making it right. And that's what we do as a community representative of God. We serve as a reconciling community together. Amen. Can I pray for you as we prepare to leave from this place? God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for this, for your presence here in this place. We thank you for moving here in this place. I pray that you are glorified here and that you will be glorified with our lives when we leave here. God, you know the condition of every heart under the sound of my voice. You know where we tend to reach. God, I pray that as we reach for you, that you would reach into our lives, that you would build us up according to your plan your fullness, God, that we would experience more of you, that we would enter through the door, that we would run, run along the way you have set before us, God, that we would be a church known for our continual reaching for you. In your name we pray, amen, amen, amen. If you have not been baptized, we got to do it. We got to get baptized. I would encourage you to sign up for that. It's going to be a great day and a great morning, and I pray that you have a great week this week reaching for God. Amen? See you next week. I love you all. God bless. Oh, can you also make sure that you take the receptacle of the communion elements and toss them in the garbage? That would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs>